Now, anyone who reads narrative theory, and I assume it's all of us, um, knows that there are two stories that uh, narratologists tell about the development of their discipline. Excuse me, I just have to throw this down there. Um, the first is how classical narratology, which arose largely from an encounter between structuralist linguistics and the study of the novel, has been renovated by a plethora of post-classical interdisciplinary approaches to narrative across media. The second is about the emergence of a narrative term across the humanities and social sciences. Now, I don't know how many disciplines have officially turned to narrative. I know it's a lot. Um, but I think the most important and prominent are history, psychology, law and sociology. And the most recent uh, is international relations. So I'm interested in how these stories frame research in the field today and the impact upon the disciplinary identity of those who use narrative theory to conduct research in their own specific disciplines. Uh, in my case, literary studies, and probably in the case of most of us here, as Roy will point out. So to shift into oral conversational storytelling mode for a moment, I will par paraphrase the story of narratology as I've heard it in this way. Well, we went through a very tough time in the 1980s there, with post-structuralism deconstructing the transcendental signified of underlying narrative structures, and cultural studies telling us that our heads were stuck in the text. But then, feminist, narr feminist narratology helped pioneer a whole range of contextual approaches, and then cognitive theory showed us how to revive the transcendental signified in the form of the human mind. And guess what? While we were doing that, everyone else discovered narrative too, especially through the life as narrative metaphor and the narrative identity thesis of psychologists. So now we're important again. To quote Monica Flutenick, the revived concern for narrative in history, legal studies and economics may indicate the incipient or ongoing rehumanization of the social sciences. Profiting from these trends, narratology finds itself again flourishing. Now, as the title of this conference attests, debate exists about the extent to which narratology can and should integrate knowledge across these fields, and hence about its function as a discipline in its own right. Now, Mati Haivaranen uh, points out that it is actually, I quote, limited exchange between narratology and narrative turn literature, which is what we've sort of been discovering here. What binds these stories, though, uh, is a kind of cross-disciplinary consensus that narrative as a cultural artifact, a mode of thought, and a social practice is the result of our evolved cognitive capacity for making sense of the world. So I'm going to bring up Jonathan Gottschall again, but this time in his book, The Storytell Storytelling Animal, from 2012, where he says, the human mind was shaped for story so that it could be shaped by story. Now, claims such as this that we are hardwired for narrative are regularly used to explain the ubiquity and universality of narrative, and thus to justify the significance of ongoing research in the field. But really, I, I don't really know how helpful these claims are. You know, for me, it's like saying we're biologically designed to enjoy having sex. Now, that might be true, but it doesn't help me have better sex. But in literary studies, it enables uh, literary Darwinists and advocates of theory of mind to offer scientific evidence for long-standing claims about the ethical benefit of reading literature via the sympathetic imagination. Quote from Gottschall, the constant firing of our neurons in response to fictional stimuli strengthens and refines the neural pathways that lead to skillful navigation of life's problems. From this point of view, we are attracted to fiction not because of an evolutionary glitch, but because fiction is, on the whole, good for us. Now, what makes this sort of claim different from traditional claims is that rather than being associated with canonical fiction, say from F.R. Leavis's The Great Tradition to Martha Nussbaum's 19th century social realist novels, Gottschall is indiscriminate. Any story will do. In his final chapter, Gottschall argues that fears for the death of a novel in the age of digital media are alarmist but that even if the novel does die, story never will, so we shouldn't worry. Well, I do worry because I like novels, not stories. For me, in this view, literature is subsumed into the broader category of fiction, and then fiction becomes equated with story. Another example of this generic reductionism is the tentacular reach of narrative theory into studies of lyric poetry. 
So, for instance, in the introduction to the narratological analysis of lyric poetry, uh, Peter Hewn and Jörg Schonert argued that the leg legitimacy of their approach, quote, depends upon the premise that narration is an anthropologically universal semiotic practice, independent of culture and period, used to structure experience and produce and communicate meaning, and is, as such, one of the basic operations that work even in lyric poetry. See, now again, this may be true, but the question is why this ought to be the burden of analysis. Uh, Hewn and Schoenert argued that the stories in lyric poetry are concerned primarily with the psychological interior of the, the speaker or protagonist, and that what they call the performative immediacy of, lyric po of, a, of a lyric poem is, I quote, analogous to the speech of characters in, dr in dramatic texts. Now, this approach consolidates further what um, Jonathan Culler criticises, I think, as the adverse effect of novelistic criticism on the study of lyric poetry by seeing lyric poetry as a dramatic monologue. And this you know, neglects the anti-narrative impulse of lyric temporality itself. Now, turning to the broader narrative turn, uh, Mati Haivaranen cautions that the story of literary narratology heralding the narrative turn and providing analytic tools which have travelled across the disciplines cannot necessarily be sustained, and I think we're discussing this here as well. Um, and that the rhetoric of a narrative turn is a retrospective construction which overlooks the history of multiple narrative turns. The cross-disciplinary appeal to narrative uh, since the 1980s uh, certainly has had has larger significance when understood in the context of Leotard's seminal co concept of postmodernism as an in incredulity towards meta-narratives. Now, in a 2003 book, Narrative After Deconstruction, uh, Daniel Punday points to an unresolved tension in Leotard's work between the totalizing function of narrative and its capacity to re reveal its own contingency. And he argues that this tension underlies the appeal to narrative and critical theory as an alternative to deconstruction. So Pandey's diagnosis, I think, helps to explain contrasting directions in the narrative turn. In response to the radical scepticism of postmodernism, um, na narratology turned to cognitive science as a new pilot science, to use David Herman's phrase. At the point when the linguistic term became exhausted, we took up the cognitive term. Um, and many positioned um, narrative, narratology then in, in opposition to deconstruction. So, for instance, Alex Giros argued in 1993 that by respecting scientific knowledge, uh, we can rescue, quote, we can rescue narrative from constructivist cynicism. At the same time, what Martin Kreisworth calls the narrativist turn in the human sciences was marked by an anti-positivistic trend away from empirical methods and scientific truth claims, and towards analysis of the rhetorical and constructive nature of identity and social relations. But the two approaches are not incompatible. So for instance, in a book called Postmodern Narrative Theory, Mark Curry comments, quote, it does not seem at all exaggerated to view humans as, <coughs> as narrative animals, as homo fabulans, the tellers and interpreters of narrative. Now, in a book called Feminist Security Studies, a narrative approach, which came out in 2011, 11, Annick Wibben um, quotes this line from postmodern narrative theory. Um, and this book, Feminist Security Studies, a narrative approach, is designed to challenge positivist methods in the discipline of international relations by showing that global security narratives are the product of hegemonic state um, interpretations of events. And she wants to offer feminist counter-narratives drawn from uh, personal stories. And Wibben's um, method is this really interesting melange where she argues, in the context of international relations, the necessity of a post-structuralist approach to narrative. While at the same time, she applies fairly conventional narratological category categories drawn from Mickey Baal's narratology. And she applies these to narratives such as George Bush's September 11 address to the nation. I think, though, that the, the most important effect of the rhetoric of the narrative turn is the assumption, or at least the ideal, that multiple disciplines share the same object of study, something called narrative. 
and thus that we must foster genuine dialogue and exchange between disciplines. While most scholars are happy to acknowledge that different disciplines work for different concepts of narrative, the desire to integrate knowledge you know, is powerful. So in his 1991 essay, um, The Narrative Construction of Reality, Jerome Bruner argued that the object of his discussion was different from that of literary theorists of narrative. I quote, the central concern is not how narrative as text is constructed, but rather how it operates as an instru instrument of mind in the construction of reality. One would have to say that in the intervening decades, these objects seem to have merged to the extent that Sandra Heinen and Roy Summer felt the need in 2009 to state that, I quote, narratology is first and foremost a study of narrative, not the mind or the brain or human nature. <clears throat> so for me, their narrative theory operates with this dynamic tension between centrifugal and centripetal impulses which are inherent to all interdisciplinary in, uh, enterprises. That is a desire to expand the knowledge and reach of a field which is countered by an attempt to retain disciplinary identity or consolidate the new one. The rhetoric of the narrative turn invites us to see narrative theory as an interdisciplinary enterprise which aspires towards transdisciplinary relevance. So here's a quote from an editorial by David Herman in his recently established journal, Story Worlds. Herman argues this, quote, the goal of what I'm calling transdisciplinary research is to avoid the kind of unidirectional borrowing that, though commonly conflated with interdisciplinarity, in fact undermines efforts to foster genuine dialogue and exchange across fields of study. Hence, still quoting, hence scholars of narrative need to move beyond adapting ideas incubated in other disciplines. Narrative specialists should instead aim to co-fashion at the ground level the concepts and methods needed to coordinate work on what can be termed transdisciplinary objects of investigation. <coughs> All right, so that's Herman's call to arms. And Herman wants to link, I quote, the study of stories with larger transdisciplinary problems that narrative scholars can help articulate. For me, this, if we're thinking about you know, what makes narratology a discipline, for me this characterises narrative theory as a kind of problem-solving service discipline. And you know, what he calls narrative specialists as guns for hire across the disciplines. So, oh, you have a problem? Dial narratology. We can find a way to help you. Now, the most off-cited quote to explain the ubiquity of narrative and its relevance comes from you know, Barth's 1966 Introduction to the Structural Analysis of Narrative, which is so well known, I don't even have to quote it. But I'm going to quote it a tiny bit. All classes, all human groups have their narratives. Caring nothing for the division between good and bad literature, narrative is international, transhistorical, transcultural. It is simply there like life itself. So this phrase, like life itself, resonates for me with the change in the definition of culture from Matthew Arnold's assertion that culture is the best that has been known and thought to Raymond Williams' anthropological approach to culture as a whole way of life. And I make this comparison with cultural studies because um, Vincent Leach has argued that cultural studies, among others, such as women's and gender studies, is a, what he calls, postmodern interdiscipline, which is um, something self-consciously constructed against the blind spots or prejudices of modern disciplines. <clears throat> the effect, though, Leach claims, has been to demonstrate that each discipline contains what he calls ineradicable elements of other disciplines. So Leach sets up this idea of a postmodern interdiscipline, but then he says that resulting from the institutional conditions of academic work, um, there is an inevitable drive for independence. For as Leach says, I quote, the origin and end of all interdisciplines is the discipline. So for me then, narrative theory or narratology can best be understood as a postmodern interdiscipline, arising out of the need to address limitations in various disciplines, but demonstrating how each contains elements of the other. <clears throat> 
So in keeping with this idea, then, one way to approach the cross-disciplinary appeal of narrative is to ask what individual disciplines turned away from and what they're turning towards. We might then see the concept of narrative itself as a contingent and changing product of specific research questions, and then investigate whether you know, ineradicable elements of other disciplines do exist in different methods of analysis. So if we want to think about this idea of you know, travelling methods, it uh, seems to me that the core narratological distinction between story and discourse is a good place to start. According to Dora Cohn, quote, no conceptual tool has been more fundamental for the formalist structuralist approach to narrative than the distinction between the two levels or aspects of analysis. Now, in literary studies, the hierarchical relationship between story and discourse has been complicated by the lo logic of deconstruction, particularly in the work of Jonathan Culler and, and Barbara Hernstein Smith. And it is now commonly accepted that story is a kind of mental construct of a fictional world derived from the discourse. Paradoxically, though, this has served to preserve the emphasis on the primacy of story. For those interested in transmedial approaches to narrative, story must be assigned some kind of independence from discourse in order to be transposable across different media. At the same time, if for Jeanette, discourse is the text itself, those interested in studying narrative uh, across media point out that this text can take different material forms. So on this basis, analysis of medium-specific techniques requires an extra level of analysis, not just story and discourse. So Chapman makes a distinction between, Seymour Chapman makes a distinction between the material substance of the narrative, what he calls style, and discourse, which is the projected utterance of a narrator. Mickey Baal makes a distinction between the text as the utterance of a narrator and the story as the organisation of the fabula. Now, of course, um, David Broadwell suggests that both style, which is the kind of techniques inherent to the, the form of film, both style and um, sujet together combine to, um, to enable readers to construct the, the, the kind of fabula. Um, and there are many, you know, several other kind of um, uh, different terminological uses of, 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 this, of these distinctions. I'm actually genuinely unclear, though, on whether this means that discourse is transposable across media, and hence is also a mental construct derived from the form, or whether discourse inheres in the material form itself, and thus is always specific to uh, a medium. And as I speak, Emily Anson is talking about this, this very problem in another paper. Uh, now, Barbara Hernstein's uh, deconstructive critique of the narratological emphasis on story leads her to claim this, I quote, for any particular narrative, there is no single basically basic story subsisting beneath it, but rather an unlimited number of other narratives that can be constructed in response to it or perceived as related to it. So that's, you know, that's fine within literary studies, but obviously such a claim becomes far more radical if applied to non-fictional narratives. So Dorot Cohn, um, you know, in her, her signpost of fictionality, where she wants to talk about you know, non-fictional narratives, um, she argues, I quote, a text-oriented poetics of fiction excludes on principle a realm that is at the very centre of the historiographer's, historiographer's concern. The more or less reliably documented evidence of past events out of which the historian fashions his story." End quote. So hence, Dora Cohen argues that studies of historical narratives require a tri-level model, which includes this referential level. And she takes Hayden Wright to task for neglecting it in his study of implotment to show the formal relation between fiction and history. So we've got this introduced category of um, the material form, which has some kind of relationship to story and discourse. We have this introduced category of the, the, the kind of referential level. In a 2004 article on narrative studies in the social sciences and particularly psychology, Vilma Hannanen makes a distinction between what she calls the told narrative, 
which is an empirical phenomenon that she defines as, I quote, the symbolic representation, most often verbal, of a chain of human events. Now, a story that a patient tells. It's a distinction between that told narrative and what she calls the inner narrative, which is a hypothetical construct referring to, I quote, the narrative organisation of experience, the story we tell to ourselves. There's the told narrative and there's the inner narrative. But she also suggests the need for another mode of narrative form, that is the lived narrative, which refers to human inactions as, I quote, enacted narratives, whereby, I quote, the narrative organisation of lived, of lived life can be seen as the basis of narrative organisation of experience. So, in a sense, there's a replication of story, of discourse and story, there's the told and the inner, um, and one is only a kind of hypothetical construct derived from the told, but then it is necessary in, in this discipline of Vilma Hanunen to say, you know, there is the lived narrative, that's the way they actually li live their lives. Um, now, these three, modes of narrative, uh, these three no modes of narrative form the basis for Hanneman of a, what she calls a model of narrative circulation, to which she adds the cultural stock of stories, that is, the totality of narrative representations that a person consumes in their life. She adds the personal stock of stories, which a person has stored in their memory. And then she adds the situation, which is what she calls the actual conditions of a person's life. So we can see here that these you know, adaptations and orientations of the story discourse distinction point to different ontological and epistemological assumptions informing studies of narrative across the disciplines. Hannanen argues that you know, the told narrative presents no ontological or epistemological problems. It's just there. And I quote, it is quite justified to bracket out the questions of the truth of the told narrative. The narratologist actually study mainly fictional narratives. So you can see, you know, there, there's a curious lack of overlap while at the same time a similarity of, of, of methods um, and, and unwillingness to gauge in, in, in kind of questions about the existence of the told narrative itself. If we are to take the idea of interdisciplinarity seriously, um, we would ask questions such as, should the study of fiction address the mode of lived experience? or the referential level. We might ask, would the human sciences benefit from engaging more explicitly with the question of medium or with the level of narrating? So, for instance, Rita Sharon, um, in her book on narrative medicine, I mean, she argues that, you know, um, doctors can develop the narrative competence um, of the, the students they're training by getting them to, to, to kind of study uh, narrative fiction. And for Rita Sharon, she focuses on the dynamic between teller, listener, so, you know, um, patient, doctor, and what she calls the narrative itself. So for me, this means the, the narrative turn ought not to be constructed as a common interest in the universality of story, um, to which we can then all kind of get together and, and, and um, you know, integrate our knowledge, but rather an opportunity to question assumptions about narrative which inform discipline-specific approaches to narrative discourse or the told narrative. It also offers a chance to question how the, the rhetoric of interdisciplinarity influences contemporary scholarship, and particularly in relation to the strategic missions of universities in the knowledge economy, which is something obviously I can't go into here. But I think you know, this would involve um, a study of the many research centres in narrative, one of which is Royce, um, which have emerged in the new millennium, and how their interdisciplinary rhetoric um, aligns with the strategic missions of, of, of universities in the, in, in the modern university system. So to conclude, uh, what makes narratology a discipline? I don't know. Um, but for me, as a scholar of literature, global theories of narrativity are effective only if they actually help me, my research in literary studies. Establishing essential properties which exist in any and all narratives may be useful for, for comparing different forms and for theorising narrativity in general. But the question is whether our object of study is always and only something called narrative rather than, say, literary fiction.
Take the concept of a narrator. And there are, of course, you know, internal disciplinary arguments against the existence of a narrator in, 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 in literature, such as those offered by Anne Banfield um, and her unspeakable sentences. But to argue that films or plays or paintings don't have a narrator, and therefore a narrator is not a core feature of narrative, has relevance only if you think you know, narrative is independent of its, of its medium. Um, and here's where I think narrative becomes equated with story. Whereas I would argue that narrative uh, can exist only in its medium or, or its told form. So for me, a narrator is essential to, to the medium of, of literary fiction. Uh, so I'm going to stop there um, and say that I don't know why we feel the need to say, hey, look, everyone is talking about this thing called narrative. Let's get together and like, come up with this you know, common idea of what it is and how we can share methods. Uh, for me, uh, if that doesn't help me in the research I do in literary studies, um, it's not useful. But then does that mean I'm not a narratologist? I don't know. Thank you for your time.